Here, a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical center of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hello, sit down, please. Thank you. Now you are a new patient, aren't you?、Y、yes, that's right. Okay, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S O N or S E N? H A N S E N. Okay, and you're a first year student. Yes, I am. Study in、uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Two eight o five Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. Two eight o five and Hesperian. Yes, that's H E S P E R I A N, Hayward, H A Y W A R D. And your phone number? Seven three four two four six five five. Seven three four two six four five five. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two four six five five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And、um, when were you born? Ah,、uh, the fifteenth of June, nineteen eighty-six. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to ten. Good. So, what's your problem? Well, frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to. Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time, and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy, or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first, I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And、I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I? Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So, do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last twelve to twenty weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well?、Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. 
Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counseling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counseling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food. And two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, Birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies, and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe, from the North Pole to the South. 
The Arctic Tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometers each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda, and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. And we had an individual task, too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then, at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. And so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. 
depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one, so my general skills improved, like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but while you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I am about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering? Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really helped to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States 
over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition, statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee Project, with students making gains that are statistically significant, and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California Initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the latest... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Thank <laughs> you.